What does low AMH mean and should I be worried? This is a really important question because it is existential to say, oh my gosh, I am running low on eggs and this may affect the future of my family and all my goals. And as someone where my family personally was affected by this, and this is something I care deeply about. So who am I? I'm Dr. John Preston Perry. I am a board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. And I care very deeply about women's health and their issues. So what we're going to talk about is how AMH uh, can have variable levels and have meaningful impacts on whether you will or will not get pregnant. So if you are personally affected by low AMH or low ovarian reserve and wanting to know what your options are and what this means for the future, this video is for you. The, our whole channel is dedicated to sort of giving answers about people's biggest fertility questions in an evidence-based way. So if this is of interest to you, like, subscribe, share, and give us your questions. And we'll talk about them as general medical information. One can't give individual advice over the internet, but we can give at least principles that can give people nuance and insight in how they have conversations with their clinicians. Okay, so let's talk about what we should know about AMH. So what is AMH? AMH is anti-Mullerian hormone. It's also a Mullerian inhibiting substance. It's kind of interesting. It's actually having an influence on, you know, whether or not the uterus develops um, in a person. Um, and uh, so it's actually the uh, part of the Y chromosome makes it uh, for that purpose to keep a guy from developing a uterus. But at the same time, once it's gotten past that stage of development in embryology, it's actually a proxy for this signal from very small eggs. And the higher the level, the more robust the reserve. And the lower the level, the more people are worried that they may have low reserve. And so generally what you see, especially for lower levels, for every 0.1 of AMH, you could possibly, if you spent $7,000 on medications, you can probably get about one egg for every 0.1 of AMH. You know, and then once you start, and that's from about the 0.1 to 1 range, roughly. And as you start getting above two, that doesn't necessarily play out as clearly. And as you start getting really to the 0 0.1, 0 0.2 range, sometimes the ovaries are, have such little reserve that sometimes they don't even respond. But ballpark, that's where it is. The way to think about eggs is like job applicants. If you have 20 people showing up for a job interview, and you're probably a decent one in the mix. If you have 40, you're in probably very good shape. And if you've got one, you're stuck with whom you've got, and they may not be qualified. So for every 0.1 of AMH, that refers to getting one job applicant if you're doing IVF. And if you're doing inseminations, by the way, you know, if you only get three eggs to show up, yes, you would like a larger pool, but you don't really want to get more than three, four inseminations, some people even just two or even one. But if you are trying to do IVF and you can only get three eggs when someone else your age can get 23, you're getting one seventh, one eighth the yield from IVF as another person. So that means very different implications for whether you get pregnant with IVF. So AMH is one of the gold standard tests for fertility testing. What are the two gold standard tests for fertility testing? Well, there's a third, the platinum standard or diamond standard that's doing IVF itself because that says what you really get. Two gold standard tests for, for ovarian reserve are AMH and antral follicle count. AMH and antral follicle count, in my experience, are equally good. Now, you'll see some studies where they say, oh, antral follicle count was worse than AMH. What really happens in these multicenter trials is you got 15 sites, 12 of them do antral follicle count really well, and three sites, antral follicle count was done poorly. And so they say, nope, AMH was better, when in fact it was only worse for those th two or three sites. And so I think you got to say, does your antral follicle count correlate with AMH? You just ask people. Um, but most places it can, and then it's equally reliable. You also have to know when AMH is better than antral follicle count. 
AMH should work all the time. You could be on birth control pills. You should be pregnant. It's a reliable marker. But if you're pregnant or you're on birth control pills, sometimes that leads to a little bit more of an underestimate of antral follicle count. And, you know, also if people have a lot of weight and they can't see the ovaries or the ovaries are scarred in an unusual place, or if they have a lot of surgery on the ovaries, which can make for inclusion cysts, particularly with advanced endometriosis, Sometimes antral follicle count is more likely to fool you. So you don't necessarily trust it in those patients nearly as much. So you have to know when you can trust which. But for most women and in general, AMH and antral follicle count are equally good in figuring out where fertility lies for ovarian reserve and whether people are running out of eggs. What do AMH levels really tell you? Everyone tries to say, oh, perfect eggs, horrible eggs, this black and white. Nope, there's a lot of gray. And it's just saying, where are you on the spectrum? And in fact, you know, used to use the term shades of gray, you know, since the movies and the books, you know, it means something different. But there's a lot of gray in there. And what you should say, oh, my AMH is 0.8. That's a little bit low. But then normal for my age is 0.4. Hey, I'm doing great. And, or you could say, oh, I've got an AMH of 1.2. That's normal, but normal for my age is 2.5. You can be both normal and abnormal at the same time. So what you want to say is not only what is it, but how does it compare to what would be expected for my age? And what does it mean for how much time I have left? And the lower the level, the less you have in reserve. What AMH can't tell you is the quality of the eggs. Some people have quantity, some have quality, some have both, some have neither. And when my wife and I had Lucas, our EMH was approximately 0.3. And so that's pretty low. People talk about 0.3 is perimenopausal, 0.1 is menopausal, or 0.075. Bottom line, Lucas came out pretty cute and good. So I would say for having low reserve, you know, we still had some good quality there, but not everyone does. And the lower the quantity, the more you worry about quality. So that's something very important to look at. Who should be tested for AMH levels? Honestly, ASRM, our national organization, questions this, where they say, look, if you are normal ovarian reserve, or your normal age without risk factors, a lot of the time the testing won't make a difference. In fact, a lot of online tests, they say, hey, buy this product, we'll get you a result and you'll know your egg reserve and your fertility. You know what? The, there's a heck of a lot to fertility more than egg count, and most people who are of a normal age have a reasonable number of eggs. It's pretty surprising to find someone who's markedly low for their age without a clear risk factor. It happens, but not as common as you would think. But I would also say there's another side to this. Some people who are saying, you know, I'm worried my egg count might be an issue. My mom went through menopause early. You know, my sister had trouble trying to conceive. It may be useful to glance at that. But at the same time, just always remember, if you want to understand AMH, if you're asking the question, is my fertility what it should be? You also have to ask yourself, is there more to my fertility than just my egg count? And the answer is usually yes. Figure out the whole picture, not just the small part of it. So are there signs or symptoms of low AMH levels? It's kind of interesting. FSH is a really low um, or unreliable marker, although there's some rare times where it can actually be useful. Um, AMH predicts things a little bit earlier. But if it's predicting earlier, Usually people don't have the symptoms by the time there's a problem. Remember, you can have low ovarian reserve about 10 years before you have menopause. So usually if there's low AMH, there often isn't a sign of it until you're really, really close to menopause. And so usually you're in the 0.3 to 0.075 or lower range before cycles start changing. By the way, everyone says your cycle spacing out and getting longer is the first sign of running out of eggs. Actually, the cycles tend to get a little shorter together before they stretch out and get longer. So those are the earliest clinical signs 
of running low on eggs. What causes low AMH levels? It's running low on eggs. That's the simple answer. And granted, sometimes there can be things that you do that causes that. You can be a smoker that will lower AMH levels a bit. You could get chemotherapy. You could have surgery to remove part of the eggs. Um, but generally, there aren't things that people do. Autoimmune disease is an interesting one where you can have low levels and then sometimes it can change. For people with very low egg counts who later get pregnant, I've seen some of the best successes in those with autoimmune disease. Even though it's low, it's less than you want. It can sometimes whack some way in where it was being attacked and then it wasn't. Can you increase your AMH level? The quick answer is probably no for most people. Um, people talk about stem cell therapy and all kinds of other approaches. I haven't seen anything convincing at this point um, where you can increase your AMH level. It was kind of interesting where high FSH could be suppressed. There were pills I was hearing about from China, and they were saying these natural herbs would improve your FSH to making it low again. What people found from these pills so they thought it was some herb. It was actually human placental extract, and then the body thought it was pregnant and then lowered FSH. So we had a case of this in the past that I was hearing about. It wasn't with my patients. It was with other people's. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm again, you're born with every egg you have. And so they're not really pills that you can take to improve AMH, and to my knowledge. Uh, there may be things that mask it. But in terms of really regenerating the eggs, which is not just the level, but where people are for fertility, I'm not aware of anything that clearly changes the existing eggs that you have to draw upon. Can women with low AMH still get pregnant? Hey, my youngest son is proof of that. And so, yes, you can, but it also starts getting harder. And the less you have to draw upon, the harder of a hand you have to play. So if you have low AMH, not only do you want to be more assertive in approaching your fertility, but also if you are thinking about a child after a current one, and then you say, hey, you know, my AMH is low. My fertility might go down 40, 50% over a year and a half, two years where between pregnancy and breastfeeding. That really matters. So it's not just being on top of it if you have low AMH, but especially if you're wanting more children than just the one, that is worth discussing with a clinician. Again, thank you so much for watching this. Uh, you know, all of us, we want to empower people to have more control over their fertility and their lives. You know, write us questions that we can answer and, uh, you know, coordinate with a clinician to better understand your fertility. And uh, again, good luck on the journey. I hope you get the family of your dreams. Don't suffer in silence. There's so many people out there wanting to help.